Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. I'm your host, Chet Czar, and today we have episode 183, Matt Levin, who's an amazing sculptor. He does really unique and cool kind of signature creatures, and um, we had a great conversation, because I've known Matt for a while, and... We really didn't know each other that well. He's one of those guys I talk about um, who's always at the shows. He's always at the Chris Velasco barbecues, the art barbecues after the shows. And I've known him for, I don't know, 10 years maybe. And we never got to, well, we had one, a, a meal at Zello's where we talked a little bit. But I still, you know, didn't know about his history. So it was really interesting to talk to him. And he's very easy to talk to. And... It was a super fun interview to do. So, uh, uh, sorry, coffee. So it's election day today. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, what else is going on? Yeah, it's, it's a weird day. It feels like a weird day just because everyone's on pins and needles. And um, so I'm just doing my thing. Uh, I had a, a hell week last week. I finished my corner commissions, the frames, framed, frame, tool frame corners and attaching corners onto frames and a bunch of loose corners for uh, Vegas, my friend Vegas, who uh, commissioned them. That was crazy. That was a lot of work. <clears throat> and it, uh, I had to work on Halloween, which kind of sucked, but I got everything done Sunday night. Or, no, Sunday by Sunday morning. And I'm just kind of finally getting back into things. And Hey, dog is snoring again. She always stops every... There she goes. Um, so anyway. Hey, I can hear her there. Okay, so let's just get on with the new subscribers. If you want to be a subscriber to the Dark Art Society podcast and support this podcast, which is the only reason it's happening... Um, <clears throat> You can go to patreon.com slash darkartsociety and join for as little as a dollar a month. Get the podcast early, get supplementary supplemental Im imagery from the artists, the guests on the show, and the Dark Art Society website, and just be part of the community we're, we're building. Okay, so I think we left off with Jeff Burner from last week. Uh, we've got a new subscriber, Cole Tideman. Thank you, Cole. That's a nice, uh, generous subscription there. Listen, 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 listen. Man, she's really loud today. <laughs> okay. Um, Melinda Jane, which an with another generous subscription. Thank you, Melinda. And... Brian Christman or Christman. That's a cool name. Um, thank you, Brian, for joining. Uh, glad to have you all on board. If you hear this podcast, um, you can join the website, darkartsocietycom using your Patreon credentials. You can log in and also look for Dark Art Society Cooperative on Facebook and um, ask, ask to be led into that group and then I will approve you and welcome you into the group. Okay. I'm keeping it short. Um, cause, uh, I want to get on with it. I got things to do. This is a great interview though. Very cool. Matt's awesome. This works great. And he's a cool dude. And, uh, that's it. So hope you enjoy this episode and thank you for listening and supporting. All right, here we go. Hello, Matt. Hello, Chet. How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm good. You're awake. I'm sorry I, I am. put yes. you off. But man, I'm telling you, there was... 
it was so loud, like right in front of our house. They're just tearing the street up with like a big, this big machine that had this, boom, 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 it was like, you know, just hammering outside so loud. And yeah, they did it all day. So that the, the next fire can't reach your house. Yeah. <laughs> they're doing something with that. I don't know what they're doing out there, but man, it's been weeks. But but they just got right in front of our house today. They started in front of our driveway. So I was just like, man, this is going to be terrible for the interview. So no. I appreciate you changing the time. To the no interview. worries. So Yeah. So I, it's been a while since I've talked to you. Have you, how you been doing? You've, it's <laughs> things have yeah, changed I, since I last talked to you. I've been good. Yeah. <laughs> like there's, there's been like a whole pandemic. That's um, true. I, yeah. We haven't talked since, since the pandemic started. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, probably the last time we talked was either at like a, a Copro show or a Velasco barbecue. I bet you it was a Velasco barbecue. I think it was maybe that one where you bought, you brought an extra um, Beyond Meat burger for me, or oh, okay. <laughs> well, then that was that was quite a while ago. Then. I know that was. Yeah. I, I, wow. Maybe may maybe that wasn't the last time. But that anyway. was like the big new thing then. Yeah, it was. So now good. that's old news. Yeah, I know. You saved the day though. There was nothing for me to eat. <laughs> I was like, you yeah. come along with the Beyond Beef burgers. I was like, yes, that was awesome. So yeah, so what? Uh, you you're you're on patreon your patreon was paused for a while and now it's back up and yeah, running for, for for a bunch of years actually yeah years because yeah. we talked about that at the uh barbecue we talked about the yeah, patreon and yeah. stuff and i just totally. noticed that you 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 re you know unpaused it yeah i mean i um this a huge great. amount of my time was being taken up by um by you know doing a day gig yeah. And, um, and that lasted for, for, you know, four years. And, um, and suddenly thanks, I guess, thanks to the pandemic, I, I had time to actually, um, to, you know, actually, well, yes, yeah, su- supply people with the, with the content that I was promising. Right. Um, because yeah, like the, the second that I realized I was having a tough time actually giving people what they were paying me for every month. I, I had to just, you know, put the brakes on the whole thing. Right. Yeah. It feels, yeah. feels bad when you don't deliver. I'm definitely a little late on some of my things. Um, but you just, you know, I, I, I try and just keep doing it. I try and keep uh, creating content and sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll do like every single day I'm posting something and then that might be like half a week or a week or something where I, where I'm, you know, not able to, but, um, I'm trying to constantly improve it. I just got the live streaming set up, which is cool, which would be awesome for yours yeah. to see you sculpt, to do your thing, sculpting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm planning on doing a lot of that stuff, but it seems like the people that are following so far are all at, you know, the, the basic kind of tier. And, right. um, so um, it takes yeah, some time. It's... It'll take some build some momentum, promote it on social media. But what you can do is yeah. you can do uh, a sample for the lower level people. Oh, okay. And go, okay, yeah. this is what I'm going to do at this level. So I'm, I'm, you know, which is kind of what I did, but I was testing it out. And, you know, I, I had to test the technology out. And yeah. so I would just kind of, I had it open to all levels. I'm like, I'm just live streaming oh, that awesome. randomly. And that way they get a taste of it. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. There's there's so many yeah. cool ways of of doing it. But yeah, um, that's a good idea. I mean, for for the moment, mine is just so far. Like since I relaunched it, been kind of deep dives into the process of this new piece that I'm working on mm-hmm. with you know lots of process photos and maybe too much written description. But I guess I'll yeah. I, I know, guess people people can skim if they want. Yeah, that, you read know, the whole thing. But I'm I'm definitely being wordy. Yeah, I think that's good, man. I think. Um, I think people, the hardcore, the real fans come to Patreon. The casual fans stay on free social media. And I don't even think they necessarily want all the deep info. The, like the people on Patreon who are real fans, really interested in what you're doing, want all the deep dive stuff, I think. Yeah. You know? So, well, that's good. I'm glad you're back up. I, I know we were, we were talking about it and I was telling you, you know, I was, I was encouraging you to do that. And I know you were having trouble with it, but that was, that was with the, uh, the day job. 
Um, yeah. So well, then, yeah, and every time we would talk, like, I felt like our conversations consisted of you of you saying you still at the day job, and me saying yeah, you're saying quit your fucking day job. Well, I I wasn't saying quit your day job. Maybe you came across <laughs> that way, but you know, I, <laughs> I I apologize if I was giving you a hard time, but it was no, my, no, my intentions okay. were good. Believe me, um, I was just hyped on the the Patreon thing, but um, yeah. So you're, yeah, you've had some, I mean, okay, what, you've had some major changes. Uh, how you've been dealing with the pandemic, first off? How was that? Well, been? I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, because to, to an extent, and may, maybe a lot of, of artists can relate to this in a way, I'm, I'm kind of having the best pandemic ever. It's, <laughs> I mean, I, I wake up, I make some coffee, I sit down and I play with clay until I feel like my eyes are going to bleed. And that's when I know I'm done for the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you you're know, like, and it's, and like not, al- almost nothing has changed. I mean, ex- right. except that, you know, so many things have changed, you know, yeah. cause then, then it's time to, you know, go food shopping or, you know, then it's time to recognize that even though I am a bit of a homebody, I haven't seen a friend in, in a huge amount of time. Right. Stuff right, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, you seem like um, uh, a typical artist in that way, in the same way I am, whereas we're, you know, we're kind of loners to, to a certain degree, and or at least comfortable being alone and working in the studio. I think, you know, part of being an artist is you got to be comfortable being with yourself, I think. so. <laughs> to right. an extent, yeah. I mean... Yeah, just having, I guess, just having the the time and the willingness to yeah be by be by yourself, because um, otherwise the work just doesn't get done. Right. Yeah, you have to you have to kind of make that decision. That's one of the things. Um, it wasn't really that hard for me since I, I've always been pretty comfortable being alone, but I remember as I was <clears throat> starting this career, you know, kind of like okay, I can't. You know, all these other things I used to do socially, I'm not going to do them anymore, you know, because yeah. I got to put the time to the thing that really matters to me the most, you know. Yeah, it's helped me to, you know, be really on top of of just bracketing the, the parts of my day, and, you know, like and compartmentalizing things. So, you know, because working from home as well, not having some sort of secondary studio or right. shop that I go to, um, like it's it's it can be as hard to um, to not work as to actually work, because at any given moment when I'm when I'm relaxing, I look into the next room and I can I can see my sculpture waiting for me. there. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, I, I try to make sure that I put in the hours every day. But then when when that time is done, that time is done. That's good that you can do that. That's good. I mean, that's something that's very difficult for me. I haven't been able to do it yeah. in 20 years. So I, I've tried it a few times to where it's like, OK, you get up, you work from this time to this time, and then you don't work anymore and you relax. Yeah. And that's kind of um, where I want to be. Because it's yeah. just more organized and it makes sense, and and I and I just can't do it. Like I can do it for I've done it for, you know, months at a time, maybe or weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. But there's some there's always a big deadline comes up. Yeah, and well, like I mean, just yeah, this last it, week where I had to work all night, up, and yeah. you know, and th- and it's hard for me to get back on the wagon. It's like it takes me, especially the old yeah. older I get, it's like I need to r- more r- recuperation time and. And you know it's really screws my schedule up. So I don't know. I just kind that of makes sense. Resigned myself to the fact that this is kind of my life. But yeah, maybe I'm um, yeah. It there's someday. there's always got to be exceptions because you know as regimented as you try to be, you know life steps in and yeah, and throws you something unexpected and you have to, you know yeah you just have to go with it. I I'll t- I'll tell you what man I I have always been like a total night owl like i would be one of the, if i wasn't married i would be one of these all night people i would work in the night and sleep in the day and it might not be good for me though because 
Lisa says that I'm kind of a dick when I do when I have those late night schedules. <laughs> like it kind of makes makes me kind of crabby. So it might not be a good deal for me, but I swear it's like my natural tendency is always to want to do that. But yeah. I can't because you know I've got a partner. I can't. You know, it just I wouldn't be able to see her. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I've kind of over the years forced myself to have a fairly early morning schedule. And I think it partly came from wanting to still have a social life. Mm -hmm. And I knew if I, you know, if I, if I can start working at seven in the morning, then by three in the afternoon, I can stop working and I can go and just have fun. And, you know, and the earlier I get up, the earlier I get to stop. I mean, not, not that the goal is to stop working for the day, (laughs) but you know, but just to, I don't know, every day you see like a light at the end of the tunnel yeah. and know what you're heading towards. Yeah, definitely. It's just, a, I yeah. think it's a better way to work too. I mean, that's one great thing about having a day job is the, the, the structure of it. You know, it's like you have to get up. It's, it's hard to, that's one thing about working for yourself. It's really hard to, the discipline's difficult. You yeah. Know? Well, and it's a different, it, it's a really weirdly different kind of situation because when you have a normal day job that you go to, I mean, you know, you go for specific hours, but I mean, how many of those hours are you really just sitting around playing Candy Crush, not really doing anything productive, yet you made all this money at the end of the day versus when you work for yourself and you just work your ass off, you know, and at the end of the day, you haven't necessarily made any money in a tangible sense. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I don't know, it's it's weird that way. Yeah, that's, you have to really start thinking in those terms when you work for yourself too. like is what I'm putting my energy towards going to pay my rent next month, you know, or or it's hard, especially when you're inspired about something that maybe isn't going to pay the rent next month. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause yeah, I, I would love to be at a place where, where I could just say this piece of art that I'm working on is what I'm excited about. And this is the job. And if I just put in my hours working on this piece of art and then I finish it and then I sell it, that will, that will be enough to make everything okay. Right. (laughs) Um, and, and that's honestly, you know, maybe someday that'll be how that works, but that's not how that works. Right. It it hasn't been, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it seems like, Normally, if I want to try to make ends meet, I have to put down the sculpting tools and do a different type of aspect of what what is still the job, right. but is you know the part that does not come at all naturally for me. Oh yeah, that's the fir- one of the first things I learned about biz- art. The art business was take uh, take in this book I read take fifty. Take fifty percent of the time you you spend creating art and put it towards marketing. I yeah. mean that is like the most depressing truth of uh, being an artist <laughs> ever. I read that yeah. and I was like, ah, oh. but it's it's true, man. Mm. It's like you can make more money marketing your stu- your work than creating yeah. your work. I need if, to get if you have something at it. To sell. Like every every time I think about doing it. I I don't know. I just get down on myself and think like, oh, I'm going to be bugging all these people. And like these these people have gone out of their way to like follow my work. And here I'm going to I'm going to like bug them with money stuff or, you know, I don't know. It's like it, it it cheapens the illusion of a relationship that I have in my mind with all these people that probably doesn't even exist anyway, but you know, but it's, 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 but it's very romantic in my mind. (laughs) Well, you know, there's, there's, I, I, I see what you're saying and I've definitely had that feeling before, but there are other ways to look at it. Like people want, it's not bug, bugging them. They want the opportunity to buy something from you because totally. they like your yeah. work so much. So they're like waiting for you. Like, why isn't he posting more links? I want to go to his store it's, or whatever. Yeah. I want to see what he's up to. I want yeah. to buy his I know. Stuff. I, I got to keep on chipping away at, at myself, I guess. Yeah. My, my own my <laughs> own blocks about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not uncommon. I mean, that's a very common thing with artists, I believe. So, um, yeah. So, uh, God, where do we start? I, I'm Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. How about where you are now, <laughs> where you live now? You want to start there? Um, yeah, I uh, I just did a little move. 
Yes. And I guess by, by little, it, it was not very little. Um, <laughs> I, I went from one coast and I picked up my life and moved it to the other coast. Yeah. You're, um, you're, cause you're like a fixture in the LA, you know, dark art scene. So it was weird funny. to hear yeah, that was, you were leaving. I was there for, I was there for 12 years, um, which, you know, I guess it, it doesn't seem like all that long, but it's, no, it's the it longest was... I've lived anywhere you other were... than like, you know, the house I grew up in. Yeah. Where did you grow up? Uh, outside of Philadelphia. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Philly's got yeah. a really great dark art scene. Did you know that? Um, you know, I, I don't know too much about it. I mean, like I, I know, um, that, that like Paul came from there, Paul Komoda. Um, oh, and wow. like he's, he's, know that. <laughs> he's kind of in, largely responsible for me starting sculpting. Oh, I, so, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's now though. It's like, it's, it's, ha- it's ha- happening. That's awesome. bigger than, you know, I don't want to say bigger than LA, but maybe bigger or mm-hmm. as big as LA or at least as active as LA once was. Um, I, or maybe not, maybe nothing's active right now, but yeah. I mean, they were yeah. kind of like the other place in the country that had a big art scene other than LA. Awesome. You know, with well, Jer- once, once things open back up, I'll have to take a road trip. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. far are you from there? I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand this new place well enough to know how close I am to things. Right. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's Atlanta and, um, how do you like it? And it, well, it's, it's cool so far. It's different. You know, I'm, you know, trying to do my part to turn it blue tomorrow. No, yeah. yeah. I mean, not, you know, not, not to be topical, but. You know, that's something, just let me interject there. That's one thing that, yeah. you know, you know, how there's, there's a big exodus out of California, they say, because it's so mm. expensive and people are moving to like Idaho, Atlanta, um, Texas. A lot of people are moving to Texas because like the taxes yeah. are lower and stuff. And this kind of unintended, un, or not un, unintended, and unintended but unintentional consequence is that you know California is very blue, and you've got people moving to red states, and it's going to kind of contribute to 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 that in these states that are not so blue. Uh, yeah, I would. And I never thought of that until someone I would, brought it up. I would be love to be part of the the liberal exodus. I guess. <laughs> so why what why did you move? Well, I mean, I guess the the reason that I moved to L.A. in the first place um, mm-hmm. back in the day was because um, I had just finished going to school for like, digital design. And I, I decided I was going to be like a 3D modeler and work for an animation studio. Okay. And that was going to be my thing. Um, that was going to be and, my thing, too. <laughs> well, see, there, there you go. Yeah. And so um, I had never been to L.A. before. And, um, I knew I didn't want to be in Philly anymore. Mm. And so I figured, well, all the, all the video game studios, all the movie studios, all the everything, as far as I was aware, you know, in my naive mind, um, everything was in LA. So I just picked up and went there and, um, you know, and then started sending out, you know, uh, resumes, reels and portfolios and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, I guess be- began the process of never hearing back from a single place ever. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, and so while while that was happening, um, like uh, I, I connected with um, Paul Komoda because he moved to LA from Philly something like two months after I did. Oh wow! Um, and we had. We had maybe met once back in Philly, uh-huh. um, but yes, I went. I went to his place, and it was filled up with all these amazing sculptures that he was working on. Um, and I had—I don't think I had ever touched it like an actual piece of clay. Oh wow! Um, at that wow. point, wow! And um, what year are we talking here? That was two thousand eight. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow, this is so and, interesting. Yeah, and like, and I, I just, I don't know. My mind was kind of blown by all this stuff that that he had made, and um, yeah, and I, I asked him some questions, like what, like, what is this clay, and how do you do this, and then I don't know. I went to Blick the next day and got some stuff and decided to try it out. And, wow. Um, yeah, and I don't it like, and it just kind of went from there. And the next thing I knew, you know, 
my my Wacom tablet was collecting dust and I was sculpting all the time. Like you just traditionally. Right. Yeah. That's funny. That's that's similar to uh I mean it in some ways, it's sim- it's similar in this way to my situation. Yeah. I was I went I got really into digital 3D animation, and I did all these you know some vi- animations for the band Tool, and then <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm gonna t- make my own DVD of looping animations. I spent uh, six months or something working on that all m- myself. It was insane, and I just after that I was so exhausted. I was like, okay, I'm gonna paint and get into something like tactile and physical. And I so I started painting. Didn't think I was giving up the three D stuff. I just yeah. started painting. Well, but you did you did traditional sculpture as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the film industry yeah. and stuff. So, but I, even you know, like were you were doing like busts and different things like that as well? I thought. Yeah, but, I but, mean, maybe but, that was just kind of interspersed while you yeah, were painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is okay. yeah, this is like two thousand. I think I put this DVD out. Okay. But anyway, I like I got so burnt out. I went to painting, and I just never went back to 3D. And it's like it did, mm. I didn't plan on it. It's just you know it was so it was it's you know it is working in on computer animation and stuff. It's just like especially when you're learning that totally. You're, it's so it, it drains your brain. It's really. I think I even remember seeing like a like a photoshop painting tutorial that you did for Nomen or something oh, like yeah, that yeah, back yeah, in the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cuz yeah, all or, during that time I was you know 2000 I was when I made the decision I wanted to get out of effects and become mm-hmm. a fine artist and then I did a I was going to be a sculptor. That was yeah. my so I did that bust, that soft spot bust of the guy going like this. Yeah. And and then I, 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 it cost so much. It took so much time. It was so casting and molding and everything. And I, you know, I switched. And was that, was that before the bronze? That was just you yeah, doing no, like the, a, yeah. It was, was it resin? What yeah. You originally did it, it was, in? Okay. It was BJB water clear urethane <laughs> resin, which was very finicky and came out of the mold slightly sticky Oh, it still yeah. worked, but it, it it was you know I didn't use a platinum silicone because I didn't mm-hmm. know really you should, and so yeah. it kind of came out of the mold slightly sticky, but it ended up looking good, and and I was able to paint it, you know, realistically, and it was cool. But I just realized I couldn't make a living doing this if I was going to try and get out of effects. So then I switched to painting. So then I was mm-hmm. teaching myself to paint, and then then I did that DVD. And took a break from, but I was kind of, you know, I was still painting while I was doing it, but I was focusing all on that 3D animation. It was kind of one of the things I did, but I just stopped after that. Yeah. Just because I got so into painting and it was so satisfying. I just didn't really feel like the need to go back to it, I guess. I just felt fully creatively satisfied by that. Um, Yeah. I think the thing, the thing that made the the switch finally happen for, for me, because I like, I was just playing around at first mm -hmm. um, and I I ended up putting um, a couple of like my first pieces in Hyena Gallery uh, in in Burbank, and um, and I guess like one one day I just got an email um, that turned out to be from Guillermo del Toro, you know, saying, "Hey, I just bought two of your pieces, and like I you know I and I need to talk to you, uh, you know, and so." Like, yeah, all of a sudden I was like, you know, sitting in his living room. <laughs> and, you know, and, That's awesome, man. Yeah. And, and you know, and it, it was funny. Like we, we talked about, um, about like the 3D stuff and, and he said, well, you know, the reason why you never heard back from anyone, you know, with your, with your reels is because no one's ever looked at them, you know, huh. like because you and five million other people right. sent in these things, and they ended up being coasters and paperweights, and right. you know it went into a, a pile in a corner somewhere. It's like right. okay, well, yeah, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I guess having you know having someone like him kind of validate what I was doing, yeah, um, especially as such a beginner, you know, because I like my, I don't know. It, w- it was some of my very first stuff, and you know, I, I'd like to think that I've gotten better since then. Right. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but it, it, it gave me, I don't know, it gave me the courage to, you know, say, okay, this is, this is the direction that I'm going to go now. That's amazing. Wow. So when you were doing, what were you, what program were you trained in and what kind of 3D artist were you trying to be in, in the field? Were you like an organic guy or like a spaceship guy? Cause you know, they're all. No, it was definitely, definitely organic modeling. Okay. Yeah. Like what, in, what program? The, it actually, well, the first time I ever tried was, it was um, a CD that came in the back of a magazine, like a computer magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an early version of, I think, Cinema 4D. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I remember and that. Then, um, and then after that, I got a copy of Lightwave, and I oh. was playing around with that. And um, that was, Did we talk about this before? Because I, I don't remember I, hearing I, I this. I can't remember. No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Because yeah, I was because that was a light wave. That was I was okay. one of those light wave people because I yeah. got stuck in that. But anyway, they have a yeah. great modeler. Once, Their modeler's yeah, awesome. The, yeah, the modeler was really good, and it was kind of the the only part of the software because I no one was teaching me how to use it, and I didn't have a manual. I think I got crack. Um, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I did too. <laughs> I yeah. So I was just making it up as I went along. And, um, and yeah, the modeler was what made sense to me. And so I was, um, you know, though, I guess at that point I was messing around with nerves and all that right. kind of stuff. <laughs> nerves. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, then once, once I was in school, it was, it was more like Maya right, and stuff like that. That's the one to learn if you want a job. I mean, so you, yeah. how proficient did you get in Maya? Cause I was never, I was, I was, I was never able good. to do it, man. Cause I was yeah. like, I was going from Lightwave to Maya and it just seemed mm -hmm. so different to me. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. I just couldn't. I, I think was, the fact, the fact that I was like in classes where I had assignments and oh, yeah. I had to, you know, yeah, it, it yeah. really, it really forced me to make the transition. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I, t I, t I was able to get up the gumption to teach myself Lightwave through books. Yeah. And, and then I was like, okay, I really need to be in Maya. And I'm looking at Maya and trying it out. And I'm like, I just don't, I don't have the energy to do this. You know, if I was in a class, I'm sure I could have learned it, but it seems so different. Yeah. You know, but. Yeah. And I mean, what I really liked was, was modeling, but then, you know, it's this, I went to a, um, SIGGRAPH. Right. And every, yeah, everyone SIGGRAPH. had been, had been saying like, oh, well, you know, like, like I, I was in this school, I was learning everything. And, you know, so I figured, okay, well, I'll be a generalist. And, you know, who wouldn't like that? That means I can do everything. <laughs> um, but then I, like, I, I went to talk to these recruiters for these different studios. They don't want generalists. And, <laughs> no. And, and um, they want yes. specialists. Yeah, they 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 want like the most special of, of yeah, the specialty totally. thing, and I I remember this this one lady, I think it was at, at Blue Sky, um, this this guy kind of you know like um, got her attention and you know like let her know that I would like to speak to her or something like that. She was some sort of of honcho, and I I heard her from a distance yell, "What do you mean he doesn't know what he does?" <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and I remember thinking to myself, like these people aren't particularly nice, right? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, Ice Age was cool, but right. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I you know, we could. Uh, I'm sure we could go on and on about 3D stuff because I was <laughs> so into it. I used to get. I mean, we won't for the sake of the audience, but I'm yeah, just saying yeah. we both have that in common. Yeah. I used to get. Uh, it was PC magazine. What is it that? It was some really great PC magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it called? Because I was like getting into building computers and learning. I mean, I was oh, wow. totally into the computer. I built like yeah. two computers. I got a book on how to do it. But mm. uh, I forget the name of it. I don't think it was PC magazine, but it was really. Did you ever get those? PC, PC. There was one. I, I got a bunch of them. Yeah. There was I, one that was really excellent. The there was now. one. Maximum PC, it was called. Oh, okay. Wow. It was such a great magazine. It was it, The writing was really funny. It was weird. It was, like, really clever. It was really a good magazine. Like, I remember it wasn't just, like, uh, you know, standard issue. This is the new thing that's coming out. Everything was written with a sense of humor and really clever and stuff. But, man, I was, like, cool. getting that magazine every month. I was going and getting all the books. 
I just yeah. immersed myself in it. it. But it was, God, it was a bitch to learn. Mm. Made my head hurt every day. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this is killing me. I bet. And it, yeah, it's fun. It's funny to to like look back on that now because I can't. Like I have no patience for <laughs> for computer based stuff really? anymore. Yeah. It's, wow. It, it, yeah. Whatever whatever switch was turned on in my head back <laughs> it didn't then. Go, it didn't like, go. It, yeah, it's like the the bolt burnt out or something. Yeah, I you know I I see what I. I'm like that in a way too, to where it's, it's not as easy for me to learn new stuff. Like I can do it. And I just like, I got the streaming set up and I had to learn this software, this OBS software to where it's like a little TV studio and you, you know, can, it's real simple and basic, but, but it, it took a while and it's, it's just weird. Cause like everything is easier than it used to be to learn, but there's also so much so many resources to sift through to find out what you need. Yeah. And that's like the interfaces are all different now than they used to be. And yeah, I so. still love learning new stuff. It's just like the, the digital stuff isn't what's calling to me these right. days. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I, I spend more of my time just trying to think like, I don't know, maybe I'll start carving wood, you right. know, maybe yeah. I'll start doing this or, or so, you know, hey, some man. other thing, you know, it's like it, <laughs> It just who who knows? That's yeah, because I mean, I've been thinking a lot a recently artist. about how everything that I make, for the most part, ends up being made of plastic. Mm-hmm. You know, and like we call it resin, right. so that we don't have to admit that it's plastic. Right. But like, <laughs> you know, like there, like there's something that kind of hurts my heart about the idea that like you know I pour all this all the love that I can muster into this piece of clay, and then. Nobody gets that piece of clay I at know, the end of the process. Know, that piece of clay gets recycled, and I sculpt with it right. again. And what what actually is supposed to be the final lasting piece is, you know, is made of plastic, and it seems I don't know, not went, not it, it seems not as magical and romantic as I wish it was. I went through this when I started early on. I went yeah. through like this phase of plastic versus you know traditional materials Mm -hmm. and i was considering doing everything casting it in stone because at least that's you know doing like uh, like casting it in um hydrocal or whatever or 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 ultra cal and doing like finishes with wax and stuff like that just just so it's like an earth but so but what i the conclusion i came to was that a plastic is cool because it's weird. It's like this mutation. It's so futuristic. It like it lasts for a long time. It's it's very modern day. It's it's like, you know, uh it's forward thinking in a way. And um I I kind of got into the resin thing. I really like I really love it because you can do so many cool things with intrinsic colors and uh stuff like that, but yeah, I, I considered it for a while. Like maybe I should do everything in stone and just it. I know what you're saying. So I, I basically I know what you're saying. But but you do you do do you ever do like one off sculptures in in like uh, epoxy clay or anything like that? Because that's that's a way to do. I, a, a I haven't really. I mean, it's it's like, such a I bitch to a, work it's with. It's a different man. it's a different kind of a process, I guess, because you have to be working in layers and you know. Build it up, let it cure, dre- well, dremel it down, yeah. do another path, and you know, and um, I, I, I guess I'd be curious to see what what would come out of me if I, I mean, because it would be such a drastic change to my workflow. Mm-hmm. I mean, because the the pieces that I work on now, I mean, I just finished a piece that I worked on for I think like four and a half years. Wow. I mean, I, I was I was beginning and completing other pieces during that whole process. Right, right, yeah. But um, you know, like it, yeah. Just having the the Chavant that will just never really go bad. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I can work on it for. I mean, as you know, I mean, especially because I don't have pets right now, so it's not like I have to worry about it being covered with with cat fur or, right. or dog hair or something. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah. It's I. Tr- I gave it a try. You know, I've done some stuff in epoxy clay, and it was yeah. so not like. To me, it felt. It just didn't feel like sculpting. It was so different. Mm. 
it, it, it's it's almost like if you were to carve in marble, that wouldn't feel like sculpting to me either because I'm so used to working in clay. Clay is like yeah. – just feels like the perfect medium to sculpt in. It just mm-hmm. is so perfect. So, so it's like you're – it's such it's such a perfect medium to sculpt in or model in. I guess you should, they you know traditionally what you would call yeah. it. It's like you give up you give up the 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 mat, the single piece concept mm-hmm. because the the medium is so great to work in. Yeah, you know. Well, and the, I mean it's it's additive and subtractive. Like right, whenever right. I think of of working in like wood or stone or anything like that or marble, I mean it's like it's like just drawing in pen. Right. You know, right. I mean, like all, yeah. all you can do is take away. Like if you if you chip too far down, well, that's that. You're yeah, done. that's it. That's it. You gotta you gotta turn that into a wound or something on the sculpture. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotta change your design. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, it just you know, it doesn't seem like the fun part. Like the way they do these big marble sculptures, mm-hmm. you do yeah. a, they do a model in clay. Yeah. Right, and then they do that weird—I forget what it's called—where they like measure and blow it up, at least the traditional sense. And then yeah. they do the drill marks, and they drill it in a certain part, and then they chisel off the big chunks, and then they go in and start refining. That doesn't seem like it would be fun yeah. to me, <laughs> but yeah, it, maybe absolutely. it is. Maybe it. Maybe that's be. the that's the real story of how Van Gogh lost his ear. Somebody was <laughs> carving a bust of him went too far and an ear came off and he says, sorry, Vin- Vincent, your ear's got to go. Cause I cannot add anything back to this Could piece be. of marble. That might be the, the, the secret, uh, the, the lost long lost secret of Van Gogh's ear. That's right. All the <laughs> books have been lying to us. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. Before we get into, to the, uh, more current stuff, uh, were you into art as a kid? I mean, were you an art, and yeah, kid. for sure. Yeah. Um, what was your medium then? Were you sculpting or were you just met, you know? No, I mean when I when I was a kid, I guess I would just draw for the most part. Mm-hmm. Like I would yeah, I remember going over to my granddad's uh place and um and we would hang out and he would create a little still life on the table and we would sit and draw it and stuff like that. Oh, um, so he was an artist? Uh yeah, yeah. No, oh, cool. I mean just, you know, for for fun. That's that generation used to do art for fun. Yeah, it was a thing yeah. back then. It was like there were, you know, there was a whole movement of like hobbyist Sunday painters, you know, it yeah. was like a thing. So he he got me specifically into Salvador Dali at a very young age. Mm, cool. Um and um yeah, I I loved it. That was that was really cool. Yeah. And yeah, and and it's funny because growing up with with that in my head, you know, it's part of why the, the idea of dark art took such a long time to, to register as making any kind of logical sense in my head. Mm. Cause it's like, is, is there an art that is not that I don't it, like, it just seems like every, everything has such a twinge of darkness in right. it, you know? And, I mean, you know, except maybe Thomas Kincaid. Right. <laughs> that's that's not. Dark. I mean, and I I love a good jigsaw puzzle as much as the next guy. But <laughs> that's not that's not my my thing. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, you know, I don't know. But, but but it's it's you know it's it's a it's a term that everybody calls it. That's this is yeah. This was the no, and I, I the totally idea did. behind championing yeah. the term. It's like everybody's calling it that. It doesn't matter what the movement's named. We just want to identify ourselves in some way so that we could gain more momentum and acceptance and just you know just absolutely you know be legit legit i guess but um yeah yeah I mean, but, we're, we're, a, we're a culture of people walking around with you know with torture devices hanging from our necks you yeah. know with, with dead guys <laughs> hanging from them and i don't know yeah right right i mean there's yeah i, I see what you're saying too because that, that, that's you know the catholic church is f- full of dark art <laughs> You know, yeah, seriously, yeah. like G- Christ on the cross, some of those depictions of Jesus on the cross are just fucking brutal, you know, yeah. and, and dark and, uh, you know, so it's it's there in all art. It's, you know, like I said, it's just a way of maybe, um, I don't know, 
No, yeah, taking what I, everyone's no, already I, calling I it, it, and you get the idea. But, but totally. yeah, I see. Yeah, what you're I think, and it's and it's it's a community. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's right. and it's a community that I care a lot about, filled with people that have you know really been supportive of me over the years, and it means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, it's an awesome, yeah. awesome people, really great people in the community. Um, like Velasco's barbecues are just so great. You know? Absolutely, uh, and I mean, yeah, just so, him seeing as a everybody person, and you know everybody. Yeah, yeah, Chris is so cool, and everybody's. It's just a great group of people. Um, Okay, so uh, where did the where did the, I mean you're you're a creature dude, you know you do creature stuff primarily, I think. I I guess yeah, it's how did that it, is that was that something from your childhood or is that something that well, kind it's, of it's changed it's changed as time has gone by, I guess. Um, at least the intentionality that's that's there, but um, wow, how do I start to talk about that? Um, I mean, you... I guess to to an extent, when I like when I first started playing with Clay, the first stuff as I as I mentioned that I saw was was Paul's, right. and that's creature stuff. Yeah, and um, you know, and then before that, I was um, when I first got to LA, I took a couple uh, a couple ZBrush classes at Noman, mm. and that was all creature stuff. Right. And, um, and then, you know, when I wanted to figure out a little bit more of like, okay, well, I, I'm playing with clay a little bit now. I need to understand more of the mechanics of this. How do I build an armature? You know, like, like, how do I actually work with this clay? What are the tools, you know, and so on. And I ended up taking, um, taking like a weekend workshop, um, with George Duchel. Oh, okay. And again, all creature stuff. Yeah, yep. and so I was. I was just. It seemed like every resource that I hit on, one after another after another, of how to learn how to use clay, was creature people. That's interesting. And so I was. I was just you know cutting my teeth doing all creature stuff because mm-hmm. that's what I was learning. Um, and yeah, so I guess all all of my practice pieces were were these kinds of things. And I was using super Sculpey mm-hmm. and it, it already looked like flesh. Right. And, um, you know, and I was, I wanted to give myself challenges of, okay, well now I need to, I need to figure out how to make something look really wrinkly. So I'm going to make the wrinkliest goddamn thing that anybody has ever made, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and, and I would, you know, just make these figures that were just, just dripping with right. with sagging wrinkled flesh, um, and then I, you know, I started giving myself just little anatomical tests, you know, where like just for for the sketch, I would just make three circles on a page, and then I would tell myself, okay, one of these is the head, one of these is the rib cage, and one of these is the pelvis, and now I have to create a gesture drawing that oh. incorporates those three circles as those three anatomical landmarks. Hmm. Oh, cool. Um, and then, you know, when something looked reasonably cool, then I would make that out of clay. Hmm. And all of a sudden I was making really strange poses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, things that would like that no no one could ever do. What a great technique. Um, <clears throat> That's a cool And idea. it was, you know, but it was, it was fun. I learned a lot from it, you know. I mean... Because one of one of the big things that that was being emphasized in all of in all of the stuff that I was learning was that believability is more important than um, realism. Mm, right. You know, um, and so in, you know instead of being really rigid about oh well this is this is how this muscle would con- right. you know connects to this one it's like okay well if this impossible contortion was happening you know what creates a believable anatomical flow. Right, right. And yeah, and yeah, then more and more as as I was making those, I, you know, I guess I started to move on and do other things after that. And then, you know, eventually I stopped using Super Sculpey completely. And I feel like changing the type of clay I was using mm-hmm. changed a lot of what I was making. Right, yeah. Um that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and then one one day I was I was doing a sculpture of a ballerina, 
and it just looked really boring. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I just I tore its head off and I put it on a shelf. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, because I guess the, the head was the part that was that was just really boring. And um, and like at some point I pulled it back down and I ended up giving it the head of a gazelle oh, um, or like a, a spring, a springbok. Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah, it like and all of a sudden it was it it felt magical and cool and right. so yeah so i ended up doing a few different a few different pieces that had animal heads oh cool um, and i figured there's you know there's like a rich tradition of that even totally. in mytho- mythology right, and stuff right right and it is sim- it is related to i mean it's a lot of the old monsters in mythology are basically just a guy with an animal head or three animals put together. So it's like, it yeah. is. And one of the things that I did was a minotaur. So. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, man. And I just recently found out like what that story actually was. And that was really strange. Well, what's the story? Isn't it like, well, I a, guess a maze. A, I don't know the story. Yeah. I guess it's, Oh, I'm, I'm going to mess this up and there's going to be like <laughs> mythology buffs that are going to be yelling at, at their radio. But so, oh gosh. Okay. There was this King and, oh, well now I'm going to get it so bad that it's embarrassing. He, he, did, <laughs> you he, don't have he to messed up, he, he messed, he messed something up. Okay. And, but that like, and Somehow, because of the way that he messed up. Oh, never mind. You can just cut that part. <laughs> Everybody, no, like, but Daedalus De- De- was involved. What and, was it like? Daedalus, the, uh, the the guy that built the wings for Icarus. Okay. You know, so yeah. I guess he he was a dude that built a lot of stuff. But every time he would build stuff, it would ruin somebody's life. Oh. And so he he did a thing for this king that he shouldn't have done, and. And I guess it gave the king like bad bad luck, and then his wife felt like the king's wife fell in love with a bull and had Daedalus make her a special mas- machine so that she could fuck the bull. No way. Yeah, and then so she cheated on her husband with the bull using the machine, and that is how she ended up giving birth to the Minotaur who wow. the king was so embarrassed by, he then once again hired Daedalus to build a maze wow. to put to put the Minotaur in that would be so, so unsolvable that that the Minotaur could never escape. How and amazing. like it uh, it's so what's it I don't mean, know, it's, though? What what is what's the what's the analogy, do you think? Do you know the analogy? How like you know these myths are supposed to represent some truth about reality or humanity you know the the thing is is like i i was reading about all of this in a joseph campbell book Uh and in that book he's like and this is what every aspect of that means and at this moment i i couldn't tell you a single thing (laughs) i have what book was it what book do you remember well it's it's the hero with a thousand faces okay all right yeah like i've i've been like on a major Joseph Campbell kick reading everything by him that I can find. And somehow weirdly, like, you know, 10 books in, I finally got around to hero with a thousand faces, which is, you know, normally the starting point. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I, that, that's, you know, I know Joseph Campbell from the PBS interview series, which is a lot. And probably most people know, know of him. And I've never actually, I bought his books but okay. I've never actually read them because they're, you know, they're pretty dense. There's yeah. a lot of information the, well, in there. You know, that that series is what really helped me be able to read his books because, the, like, the first time that I tried, like, years ago, I it seemed kind of impenetrable right. to me, at, you know. But after watching the, you know, the series, um, going back to reading his books, I felt like his voice was in my head. Right. And I, like I could, I could hear the way, the way that he would inflect it and the right. way, like I could hear his voice in my head, like, it, and it was like, he was talking to me oh, and sudden, suddenly, um, it was a lot easier to read. Wow. That's good to know. Yeah. I got, maybe I'll do the audio book of hero of a thousand faces. Cause that's the one I wanted yeah. to read. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, like, and we, I'm finding that one to be a little bit more academic than a lot of the Oh, others. really? 
Yeah, I mean, because a lot of them are just collections of essays and stuff. But mm. there's one that I really loved called Pathways to Bliss. Okay. And that was that was a cool one. Okay. Yeah, because I guess that one specifically is um, is all essays on like, okay, we have all this information now about these myths. What are we supposed to do with that? Oh, that's how do cool. we actually how do we actually go into our lives and right. use these to to like navigate our situations in a, like a better way? I'm writing you that know, one down. So that that was that was really cool. I'm writing it down. Pathways to bliss. Cool. That sounds perfect. That sounds like just what I need. Anyway, sorry, yeah. <laughs> we got a little <laughs> little tangent there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So it sounds like you kind of weren't necessarily a monster kid, and you. Yeah. Sort I of, mean, I I don't really I don't. Like, I don't watch horror movies because they, they scare me. Like, I, <laughs> you know, like I... So you're not a I horror have, guy at all? Not really. I mean, Monster Palooza has kind of helped me be uh, like that just because I've vended so many of those shows that, mm-hmm. uh, like, I I know every character from every movie, even so though de- I haven't seen the movies. So it's like you, you've, you've developed an appreciation for this stuff just through kind of your circumstances. Totally. Yeah. Well, That's interesting. And, and I can, I can totally, you know, love like the, the, the creature design and like the, the vibe of the whole thing, you know, but if I actually watch it, like, I mean, and it's kind of a crapshoot, some will mess with me and some won't, but it's not that I don't like them. It's that they're just too damn scary. Yeah. You know, well, like, I, there's, <laughs> like when, when the movie ends, the experience doesn't stop for wow. me, interesting. you know, and like I, I and maybe that's the difference. Maybe for a lot of people, like they're the movie's done and they're like, okay, now I'll move on with my life. And you know, the movie is over and then I sleep with the lights on for a month and I have wow. to like retrain myself <laughs> to like shampoo and condition without closing my eyes. <laughs> that is so interesting. No, I mean, not, not that that's an issue for me anymore because I shave my head. <laughs> no, that's so interesting because for me, it's like, I'm bummed that now that I'm an adult, I can't get scared enough at the movies that I grew mm. up on. Like the horror, horror movies, they're not scary enough. Like I, my, my holy grail is something that would scare me in the same way it scared me when I was a kid to get that thrill. And it's, yeah. and it's like, you know, Hereditary was probably the last movie to where I, where I started getting that feeling because some of the some of the image images were so weird i don't know if you saw that one but no i didn't yeah don't don't watch it <laughs> no like i you know I've, it's cre- it's, it's got it's, some it's really creepy like parts I've, yeah i've i've seen i've seen some that just don't bother me at all they're uh, just cool movies right and then right. other ones you know like i yeah like i i watched um ritual recently oh yeah the ritual yeah. and the yeah the um the, the creature in that didn't bother me at all. Right. You know, like what bothered me was, you know, a dude getting a machete in his head in the first scene. And right. like, and that, that wasn't even supposed to be the scary thing. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. I definitely, I've become more sensitive to violence as an old man. I can say that much. Yeah. I don't like, cause when I was a kid, I was the typical, one of those weirdo kids that was like into gory movies because it was like yeah. the shock of it and also how real can they make it look and yeah and and i just have i have lost i mean i can still appreciate it because of the makeup effects history i yeah. have but i yeah I, i've i'm more sensitive to it now for you know yeah. probably because totally kids and grandkids and everything and you just start yeah. putting things in different perspective but that's interesting though that's interesting so you have I mean, it's I mean, the- but it's it's worth mentioning though that like, I mean, when I was a kid, like you know, I was I was sneaking downstairs at like one in the morning to watch Twilight Zone episodes, oh, okay. you know, when I was a little kid, mm-hmm. and I had I had like you know VHS copies of the first two Hellraiser movies when I was okay. probably too okay. young. To okay, have those, so you're so you're you know? you're not you're so not like, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, like, got a little it, bit of it's that. It's just even. yeah, it's just. It was just this weird kind of who knows what's going to be too much and what isn't, you know, right. like I, yeah, um, there were all sorts of things that I could watch. Like I love the shining. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah, but then, you know, I see things like, um, paranormal activity mm-hmm. and it's like, nope, 
that was <laughs> that was not an okay experience. Interesting, interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you 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 got it in you somewhere. I don't think you know. I think you if I think to be as good as you are sculpting creatures, you have to have it inside of you somewhere like you have it's yeah. not like you just stumbled upon creatures and then everyone was doing creatures so you started doing creatures because that's how you learned and kept yeah. going with that well, it's no, like I mean, you, the, but you, there was you know there, there was there was stuff happening like as well as far as far as what i thought i might be trying to say ab- right. about things you know like it and that's gone through a bunch of phases that's what as I, well you that's know that's what i wanted to talk about too yeah so that's good that you bring that up it's um yeah how, how does that factor in to what you're well, what, I mean, what I, are you what your statement is for for your 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 work your overarching yeah. it's it's different it's different from piece to piece mm-hmm. and you know and and at different i guess you could say different phases of of my career mm-hmm. it feels it feels weird to say that but like yeah like there there have been times when when I, I got really hung up on just our, our culture's obsession with physical beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah. And, um, and just what, what the relationship is between, I don't know, like the grotesque and ugliness and, you know, <clears throat> And empathy, right? Yeah, and you know, and and like how how much of beauty, I don't know, is almost I don't know, permission to be a terrible person or something, <laughs> right? And I I don't know, and and like it, w- w- is there a way that I could create something that would that would be, you know, very very not beautiful? but somehow still express, you know, some sort of, you know, grace or kindness Mm -hmm. or something that would evoke empathy um, in some way, like different, I don't know, different kinds of stuff like that. Um, So it's like you're you're using the, it's like you're expressing different things by using this framework of dark art or, yeah. Creatures. Yeah. It's, it's like, the, that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, when an artist chooses to work within a certain medium or a certain subject matter, it's like, you can take that medium and subject matter and use that as a framework to say like all kinds of different things that don't have to do really with anything that the framework really is. You know what I mean? Like you could say all this, yeah. like you're saying, you could, you could exp- expressing empathy the uh, thoughts about you know modern beauty culture and this and that within this kind of dark art thing, mm-hmm. and you could do. I mean, you could be saying things about evil in yeah. in, in a landscape format if you n- knew how to do it right or whatever. Sure. It's like it's really yeah. it's kind of what you like. I think as an artist, what you feel comfortable in and what mm-hmm. you and what framework you choose to express yourself. And then the ideas can be anything, even in that. Definitely. Framework, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, and after that, to an extent, it becomes a question of, you know, to what extent do you actually want to let people know what your thoughts were when you created it? Because, mm-hmm. you know, it it has it has felt to me a lot of the time like the. Like once I make it and I put it out into the world, if someone is going to connect with it, that's it's going to be their connection and they're bringing their own psychological and emotional baggage to that experience. Mm-hmm. And and like at what point does anything that I say that constricts or defines, you know, and confines what it's what it has the potential to represent will actually damage the right. piece's ability to connect with an audience. Right, right. Uh, so I don't know. It's weird to, it's it's weird to try to navigate that. Well, and, you know, and some sometimes I I hold back a lot, and other times, like you know, I guess depending on my mood, I'll just be like, oh no, that one's about this. <laughs> right. But um, uh, uh, I was gonna make a point. <sighs> 
had a really good point. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, on. no, 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 no. I was, I, I, uh, it's, uh, let me just think a second. Everybody's used to this. Don't worry. Okay. Um, it's gone. <laughs> what you, the last thing you said, you, the last thing you said was about a hell landscape. Yes. You could use the framework. You could use any framework to express. It's gone. <laughs> Never okay. Mind. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> um, yeah. But then, I mean, eventually I, I, like I moved on, I moved on from that to, to this idea of, of just how we're all in the process of becoming in some sort of psychological way. Like we're all, you know, trying to hopefully become the, like, you know, the, the best possible versions of ourselves as we move through life and mm-hmm. like evolve within, within our own lifetime. Um, and so, so I started messing around with the idea of, of mutation Mm. Um, as as ways oh, yeah. of repre- representing states of becoming, mm-hmm. and how you know, like um, like puberty is not a graceful time. Right. You know, it is an, an ugly, awkward, embarrassing time, mm-hmm. and very few people escape that. Um, and so and so, yeah, like making making a character have um, too many legs. Right. You know, too too many arms, you know, uh, like um, an extra eye growing, you right. know, it's like what. Yeah, it's like just people, people undergoing changes. And I, you know, and and when I was doing a lot of that, I was trying to I was trying to give them expressions of. I guess transcendence and rapture and mm. stuff like that, um, you know, which. I think ultimately ended up adding to just the creepiness of it, <laughs> you know, um, cause they, you know, yeah. Cause they're these people who look, you know, halfway yeah. sedated and blissed out, you know, while that, they're, That's great. while they're falling. And I, I did a piece that I think it was, it was a man and a woman, um, reaching out to each other. And between the two of them, I think they had 64 toes. Wow. <laughs> so, like, so I sculpted a lot of toes That's in, that, amazing. in that piece. Wow. You know, the, I, I keep wanting to bring this up, and this is a good time to bring it up. Yeah. Because um, this is sort of seems in, in the realm. You have this piece that has been viral that went. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, people, it's like a famous, it's famous from going viral. And I wonder if. You yeah, know, I actually people... I, I collect all the photos that I find <laughs> of the different captions that people put on it. Maybe like at one at one point, Cheech and Chong did a thing with it. Are you serious? That, like I I was over the moon. I was so happy. Now I, I think it's when when someone hands you a wet blunt. Right. Was the, <laughs> was the caption? I've seen I've seen a bunch of them. But the one I remember is when you ha- when you touch when you're washing the dishes and you touch someone's food. Or something yeah. like that. But so now the question I had is, was that image watermarked and did you get, did, did it come back to you or did it just go out and take on a life of its own without nobody knowing um, who did the sculpture? Yeah. To this day, I have never watermarked any of my ah, photos oh my and God. I probably should have. This is, yeah. you're, you're a perfect um, example just, of why you should watermark. Yeah. Why watermark? Because you never know. One image may... Yeah. Every, every like once that. in a while, someone will send me like a text or a message or something like that saying like, oh, we have another sighting and it's <laughs> making the rounds again or, you know, people send Amazing. me stuff. But um, but yeah, the posts very, very rarely will will have any kind of recognition that I was the person that made it. Maybe if maybe we should use that for the cover image. Sure. But the, it's funny the the. Um, the thing, the like, my thinking behind that piece was that you know I was doing all these fleshy-looking, super sculpted things, mm-hmm. and you know, I would show them in these galleries, and opening night would come, and I would be standing next to my piece, or like just you know, kind of looming around, mm-hmm. and I would I would be so excited for people to react to the piece, and you know, they would they would just be repulsed, you know, they would <laughs> recoil from these things that you know that I had made, um, and. 
Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's fun in a way to not let people know that you're the person that made the right. thing. Yeah. 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 Um, but, um, but so I thought it would be fun to make a piece that was as disgusted by the viewer as the viewer was by it. Oh, that's and great. so, so like that, that expression that it's making and that whole recoil that's having is supposed to be a direct reaction to it seeing whoever's looking at. Oh, it. that's fucking perfect. That's great. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's great. It's amazing Thanks. that it, that that was the piece too that that uh, went viral because that's such a such an incredible concept. It's a great idea. Ah. I'm jealous of that idea. I have to say, I'm jealous. <laughs> well, I think of that this idea. might be the first time I've actually said out loud that that was what it was. Oh, really? So, yeah. <laughs> wow, we get a scoop here on the Dark Art yeah. Society podcast. That is such a genius idea, though. It's great. I love it. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. That's that. That people are going to trip out when they see it after hearing this. Well, if we if we use it for the cover image, they're going to be like, "Oh, it's that guy." But. Um, yeah, it's a great piece too, though. It's it's uh it's Thanks. there's a lot of humor in that in that piece. Mm. You know, it's funny. I think. I mean, was it intentionally yeah. funny? Um, I don't actually remember. Yeah, like <laughs> I I don't really remember. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to but, ask. I mean, since we're talking about the 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 meanings and stuff, I'm, I want to ask you how you how you develop your your work from concept to completion. Because, you know, I've talked about it many times on the show. I'm more of like, a, I kind of go intuitive and mm -hmm. don't know what it means really, generally. I'm just doing something to, because I think it's fun and I see, let it develop. And the meaning will end up becoming clear by the end of it to me. Or, or yeah. maybe, maybe a year after I finish it. Because most of the stuff, I'm not thinking, it's the meaning isn't. The, the important thing to me, it's like the, I have a certain criteria on what I think makes a good painting and I try and hit those points. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, but I don't verbal, a lot of, a lot of the time I don't verbalize like a meaning behind it. It's more like an expression, an emotional expression that captures an emotion. And if I can capture that emotion, I'm, I'm happy, but there, there often is like, kind of a specific meaning about the piece. And so I'm curious yeah. if, if, and, but I know other artists that like, you know, come up with their idea. They want to express this idea. So they mm -hmm. figure out different ways they could do it. And they figure out on one that they really like, and then they go with that. And I'm just kind of curious how your, what your workflow is in that regard of, yeah. to concept and stuff. It, it really varies from piece to piece, you know, like a, there are a lot of times where I'll just do like a quick little thumbnail sketch mm -hmm. or I'll do a whole bunch of thumbnail sketches until one just kind of excites me in some way. Um, and then and then I'll just start building an armature and go from there. OK, um, I mean, but it does, you know, it helps to do to do like a quick pencil sketch first mm -hmm. um, just because you do have to build an armature. Um, right, yeah. So, you know, it's a. It, it's helpful to know what the proportions are, are going to be and, you know, what, you know, just what the weight requirements might be and different kinds of things like right. that. So just from a technical side, mm -hmm. you're building something that will be structurally sound. Though, I mean, I, my current piece, we can talk about that. But, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, and then I, I go out of my way to not put any detail into those sketches um, just because I, I definitely consider myself to be a, a sculptor and not a, like a drawer. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to make sure that as much of the creative process happens in the clay as possible. Um, and so, yeah, I just let things develop as they will. And a lot of the time as, as I'm working, a lot of the, the, the significances will kind of develop and manifest okay. as, as that process is happening. Um, that sounds like how I, I mean, do. but it's but it's not it's not always the case, you mm -hmm. know. Some, yeah, sometimes yeah. I do a sketch and it's like, oh, this is about this, right, right. You know, and I mean, especially if I'm going to be doing a piece that um, that's a commission, right. Um, it it's fairly rare that that someone who's doing who's asking me to do a commission piece for them is going to be laid back enough that they'll just say. Yeah, do whatever, do whatever you, want. you want. Just see, you know, see, just, you know, 
yeah, see how it turns out as you do it. Right. And, you know, they like they'll normally have some sort of an idea. They'll want to see a sketch that's more fleshed out, you know, right. and then and then I guess I have to like crack my knuckles and hope that I can draw a little bit. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's that sounds like uh, very similar to how I work. So yeah. I, I I totally get you there. Um, so you, like when you're doing the first initial thumbnails, is it like? Mm-hmm. You're just doing it to do it, to doodle, just to come up with a cool thing. Oh, I mean, and then well, you see what grabs you. A lot you. of the time, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, because it like it happens in the in the process. Really, I, there are very few times that I'm just sitting around and I just like out of out of the ether, you know, yeah. just apropos of nothing. I think, oh well, this would be a good idea yeah, for sculpture. Yeah, I, I, I like, almost never get that. I've had it happen, yeah. but not very often. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, more, more of the time it's, it's like a, well, I, I'm a sculptor and I love sculpting and uh, like, you know, and there you go. I, yeah, like, yep. <laughs> that's I, it. I, I need to start sculpting something so that I can feel that, you know, that right. amazing feeling that I get when I sculpt where, you know, the world falls away and exactly. I'm just in, you know, in my special place. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah. the flow state. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because it's the, the the joy of doing it. It's all that's how I feel. It's like to me, more than anything, it's about just the joy, the joy of mm-hmm. of doing it. So you know, when it's done, it's not. You know, I don't like look at my stuff a lot after it's done. It's like the fun part's yeah. over. You know, this painting's cool. I love the painting and everything, but. I don't get off on looking at it like I get off on making it. That's where it's like the super most fun I'll ever have is when I'm making the the painting or the sculpture. Absolutely. So I mean, even just the, like the feeling, yeah, like the feeling of just making making one beautiful stroke mm-hmm. that just come comes out right and, right, and I look at it and it's this this one tiny fraction of this great big thing, and I. You know, I yeah, it's I, it's indescribable, I guess. Yeah, it's such a weird yeah. thing. It's it's like it's like playing. Mm-hmm. It's like playing, like when you're a kid. I think is the the closest description I could think of to where it's you're just doing it for fun. It's like this. What is play? I mean, what is yeah. play? It's like what a kid does because it's fun. Whatever they do, whatever you think to do because you want to do something fun. It's all about joy, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I guess it, the idea of the flow state kind of connects to sports and stuff too. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, people freak the fuck out over sports, you know, like, right. Yeah. I, I guess it's, maybe it's the same, but we, we get to have the fan experience and the athlete experience right. at the same time. <laughs> I don't know. I just made that up. That might be totally <laughs> off know. base. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's a trip. It's a mysterious thing. It's 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 just funny because on one hand it's this deep mysterious thing that people who don't create artwork don't fully understand. And on the other hand, it's like every kid, it's what every kid does naturally mm-hmm. without being taught. So how you know, it's in a way it's not that special in a way because it's like kids do it just for just they just spontaneously do it but really that's so much i think of what art is about is getting mm-hmm. to this deep you know the reason kids can do it is because they ha- they don't have all the baggage yet you know so yeah. it's like they're naturally this kind of more creative and in touch with their creativity and their imagination you know because yeah i mean it yeah like the just the mundane aspects of adulthood like just yeah, well, yeah. really quickly wears, at- atrophy. Yeah, that. yeah, and it wears you down, and it's uh, yeah, it's something uh, you know, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. And you, you know, maybe this is a good time to talk about your you're you're into Eastern philosophy and yoga and Zen, right? I mean, we kind of talked a lot all, about yeah, all sorts of weird stuff like that. Zen I like meditation it, to, to and, the point. To the point where, yeah, like uh, for my undergraduate college experience, I went, um, actually went to a Tibetan Buddhist college. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. I know you, was, you did tell me about this. Weird. I don't quite remember it, but I remember when we had Zello that time. Yeah. I know yeah. we talked about your, uh, your, your Zen period. That was some really good pizza. 
Yeah. Oh my God. I had some last night. <laughs> it's <was> so good. <laughs> Cornmeal crust, baby. Wow. So, so, um, yeah. What was that like? And how did you get you know, to that point? You know, the weird thing is it was, it was like every other place that I had been just in reverse, you know, like one of the things that, that, that led me to, to that kind of place and to seek out a lot of the Eastern stuff to begin with was that I lived in a super Christian area. Like, you know, everywhere you looked, there was another church and, oh, really? you know, I, yeah, like I, you know, I, worked at a cafe and, you know, people would on a regular basis tell me how they were going to pray for me and all these different kinds of things, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah. So I, you know, I just, I wanted to move in a, in a different direction. And, you know, I started, what was the spark the guy? I mean, what was, was there a first, like for me, it was, I think it was Alan Watts. Alan Mm -hmm. Watts was the thing that kind of, led me on that path. I think that's the first thing I could remember that got me like, this makes sense to me. This philosophy yeah, no, I, makes yeah, sense I remember, to me. I remember like going to the, the Eastern philosophy section of like my local borders and just sitting on the floor and just accumulating a pile of books mm-hmm. and like, no, no one told me to leave. And I just sat there and, you know, God, like day after day, it seemed. Yeah. And, um, so it just resonated yeah, I, that kind of thought just resonated with you. Yeah. It makes like sense. I just, yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, mm-hmm. like the version of it, like at least in the stuff that I was reading, it just had so, so little dogma, you know, no mm-hmm. one was yeah, telling me yeah. that I was going to hell. No, like no one was condescending, you know, no one was, no one was using, was using their faith as an excuse or like a, you know, a a way to, you know, try to put me down so that they could feel special, you know, like all this stuff, like creating all these, these them, like these, these little us groups by creating thems. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know, like, yeah. If, if your religion like necessitates you shitting on anybody that uh, like, you know, that doesn't believe the exact right. same thing that you do or like looking down on them or thinking that you're better or whatever, uh, you know, you're doing it wrong. Check this you out. You know, and that's the, oh yeah. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. Finish your oh, thought. Well, that's, but that's, that's the thing that I ultimately discovered, you know, when I, when I went to the Buddhist school um, is that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily baked in, to the religion it's baked into individuals um and you know like (laughs) american buddhists have every bit the you know the likelihood of being like a condescending like holier than thou piece of shit totally that you know that anybody from any other religion does this is this is perfect this is a perfect intro to what i was going to say i just saw this video the other day it was uh uh this guy, what's his name? Zizak. It's, that, uh, it's like this uh, uh, Slavic philosopher dude. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. He he's uh, really brilliant. He talks crazy. He's got like a Sylvester talk. <laughs> it's really it's kind of hard to get past that part of it, and he's got a heavy accent, but he's brilliant. He was huh. saying that. Uh, he was talking about this sort of thing. He was saying that uh, who was it? One of Hitler's main dudes, uh, Goebbels, maybe, or one of these guys. Okay. A book he always kept on his side in his pack was the Bhagavad Gita. Huh. Which and, and and he was making the point that you can use anything to justify anything else. And he was saying that you know because the whole thing in the Bhag- Bhagavad Gita is like. Uh, I think it's like Krishna is talking to, I read, I read it a long time ago is talking to this soldier and the soldier's like, you know, I, I don't want to kill people. I'm, you know, I, I want to be good, blah, blah, blah. And I think it's Krishna or, or some Hindu God or something is, is tells him, uh, you, you have to, it's all a game and you have to play your part and your part is a soldier that kills people. So you have to do it. And it's like, he used that philosophy in order to get these German officers to do just like horrible things. Yeah. And it's so weird. And he was also saying that 
the uh, 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 Suzuki, that teacher, the the Zen uh, DT. DT? Yeah, yeah. Suzuki. Dissets. He was saying that dude in the. I'm really in the. 40s, I guess, when they when they were when Japan was like, you know, doing all kinds of horrible shit and trying to invade China and stuff, and, yeah. and he was like a nationalist back then. It was so part, and it's like he's like this peaceful Buddhist, amazing teacher, and he was. And the the point was, this guy was saying, it's like you can use as much, you know, Zen and, and Eastern philosophy gets the gets the thing like it's it's not just like kind of you were saying and i think the reason i was attracted to it as well is it's non yeah. non-judgmental and, and it's passive it's more passive than it than it, than whereas um uh western religions seem to be more like aggressive well and, and it seemed more like a philosophy than like right, a, you right. know than That's like less a religion yeah less yeah. dogma but the point the guy was making was you can kind mm-hmm. of take anything and yeah and use it to justify hor- the most horrible shit, which I found Absolutely. like really interesting, you know, it's, yeah. it's just kind of just, it's basically just what you were saying. You know, it's, it's the individual and how they use it yeah. really. Yeah. But I mean, how the, the experience, what was that experience like at going to school there? Well, I mean, it was, it was cool in some ways and really frustrating in others, but you know, um, I guess, you know, in just mat fashion, I, you know, I went to the Buddhist place and, um, when I was there, I ended up taking like all Western classes. <laughs> I, like, cause I, I don't know, I guess I was at a point where like, whatever I was in, I, I wanted to say, fuck you too, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Like, so, That's so funny. I, you know, I took Western philosophy classes and, um, and like, you know, I studied Greek and, um, yeah. And I ended up, my major ended up being creative writing. Oh, wow. Huh. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, Grant, like it was weird. Like, it, um, instead of a, like a normal core curriculum, um, like, or at least part of the core curriculum was that every semester you had to take, uh, like a traditional Eastern art class. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would like, instead of like gym class or whatever, I guess, you know, I would be doing, um, like, Med, like sitting meditation or Tai Chi or Aikido or some different kinds of things like that. And you know, that, that was all fun. Yeah. Yeah. You wow. know? And, yeah. But it was, it was definitely an interesting time. Yeah. But I like, I feel like the biggest takeaway that I got from it was just that, that no matter where you go, some like you're going to meet people that are really, really wonderful and you're going to meet people that are really, really awful. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and that, yeah, you, you just got to keep your eyes open. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I re- one thing I love about Buddhism is the idea of um, waking up to that most people are, that we're all in this constant dream state or kind of zoned out zombie state with not, not yeah. seeing the true essence of reality. And, um, and just the idea of, of being able to wake up to it, you know, yeah. that is, is, is a, I, I don't know. I just, it, that, that always, I always felt like when I would listen to Alan Watts stuff, like it woke me up to reality, yeah. you know? Definitely. Yeah. And yeah. Like, like you were saying, he, he was one of the first people that, that I went to, you know, those days, days sitting on the floor and borders that, and, um, there was a particular edition of, um, of the, uh, what's it called? The, the Tao Te Ching. Yeah. That, that's a that good I really one. liked. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love that too. Yeah. It had like, like cool, I guess, black and white photography mm-hmm. of, of like little nature scenes and stuff and that. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my go-tos. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's inter- the thing about Alan Watts was, uh, it, not a lot of practical knowledge as far as how do you, how do you get this? It's, it was, it's more, I guess, pure philosophy. It's not so much like, you know, if you want to see things this way, you physically need to do these things although he did talk about meditation as a way to do it but it was more about just the philosophy of it which Mm -hmm. you know um uh not you know just i know i know of friends of mine who were turned off to alan watts because it's like there's not a lot of practical knowledge on it's all just talking about the thing and there's not a lot of practical knowledge on how to get the thing 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and it's funny. I mean, you know, a, a lot of these people, they have like they have a really charismatic way of speaking. Right. And they'll talk for an hour and I'll be like, fuck yeah. You know, <laughs> and then like the second they're done, you could put a gun to my head and say, tell me anything. Right. I said. <laughs> and I can't. I, right. You know, it's like, like and it's one of those things. It's like, OK, well. Like, was it just my inability to retain the information or was he just a really charismatic speaker that also didn't really have a whole lot to say? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, that's it's, I mean, I don't know. it's weird, especially with Watts. It's like, you know, he he had to have I maybe he just was really good at teaching it. He, But he it yeah. seems like he had to have like real not like firsthand experience of this of like states of enlightenment. But he was, you know, a total alcoholic and, mm-hmm. you know, I think a wife beater from what I've heard. Like he, he yeah. womanizer for sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's weird. Like a, a lot of like the, like the most highly revered, enlightened, like Tibetan Buddhist saints and stuff. Like they started out as like rapists and murderers really? and all these wow. awful things. Wow. Yeah. It's weird. Like if you go back and read their stories, it's, right. it's crazy. And then, you know, they, I guess they decide to sit on a rock for 20 years or something and you know <laughs> well alan, just, think of, yeah alan watts though was like you know he it's almost like he had he, you know he took the information and used it as a way to just be like f- fuck it it doesn't matter so i'm just yeah. gonna party basically none, none of yeah. it really and matters. see that's that's another that's another one of those ways that you're talking about that you know you can if you're smart enough, you can <laughs> twist. You can twist basically anything into tricking yourself into doing so. Right, you know, like right. or tricking someone else. Right. It yeah. seems like you know, instead of convincing other people to kill people, he used it as a way to you know convince himself that it was okay to do what he yeah. actually wanted to do and not have to have discipline. Right. Exactly. So I mean, that's not fair of me to say because I'm just basing that on what you said. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm. I don't know but, the, the whole story. I've read some stuff, but yeah, it's almost like he used it as an excuse to continue to be an alcoholic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because once once you decide that everything is an illusion and and nothing is real and nothing really matters, well, then what's to stop you from doing basically anything? anything? I know, um, I know, I know. You know, I know. And that, you know that's what you know. I feel like it's important to keep in mind, like with any of that stuff, things like you know what is important is is compassion and empathy and love mm-hmm. and kindness yeah. and you know. And, and happiness and, yeah, like trying to give yourself a life that will be filled with joy and try to look for opportunities to, you know, help the people that you come in contact with have a little bit more of a joyful experience as well. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, like that's that's pretty, pretty worthwhile. That's got to be better than killing someone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's at the essence of every religion pretty much i think you know i i i think i would say even at the core level yeah. of christianity and everything is really that i think um you know uh, of course people make the argument for all kinds of other shenanigans but sure. um yeah yeah well i mean but even even that's making strides i mean you know as of this month, I guess the the Pope is officially more liberal than the Supreme Court of America. Right. <laughs> yeah, I just read an article so, that the Vatican was saying, "Well, you just because the Pope said that doesn't mean we're changing the policy." It was he said something yeah, about yeah. civil civil unions. They, I just read this like before we did yeah. this uh, interview, so they were like, "Not so fast. We're not changing anything just because he said it." But uh, yeah. it, it is it, it is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, okay, I wanted to ask you. Let's c- can we talk a little uh, technical sure. info because I'm okay. a, I'm a process junkie and I love technique and things like that. Um, <clears throat> what's your go? Your go to is Chavant. Your go to clay nowadays? Yeah, I I tend to use um, Chavant either medium or hard. Okay, yeah, I've never um, had a lot it, of luck with hard myself. Yeah, you know it's. Um, it's too hard. A lot of the pieces, a lot of, yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I've definitely given myself some nasty blisters, um, yeah. from, from using it, but, um, but some of the pieces that I make, 
the the armatures are just too flimsy to be able to um, to get away with using medium. Oh, I see. Um, there's just too, right. too much too much weight and not enough rigidity. Whereas with with the hard, you know, it's it's still not perfect, but but I can I can get away with a lot more as as far as like having like really um, understable armatures. Yeah, goes. that's so fr- it's so hard working on a something with a flimsy armature that keeps cracking at a joint yeah. and you have to keep repairing. And that's, it. yeah, the, the piece I'm working on now is, is in, um, the Chavant hard okay. and, and still I've, I've had to take it apart and reinforce the armature, I think three separate times. And this morning, um, coming back after the weekend, there was just a big crack in the clay across oh, that God. exact same spot again. So I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do next. So um, how are you, how do you, okay. So do, when you make your armatures, cause armatures yeah. are so important and yeah. there's something that I, I learned enough to where I could fake it, but I never really mm-hmm. made a ton of art. I made, I made enough to where I know how to make them if I need to, but I, I, was, I was always a head and shoulders kind of guy, and it's like you can just yeah. do a big block of clay for that. Um, so uh, I think the the most useful way of making armatures I have found is using, you know, obviously twisted armature wire and then yeah. coating it with um, epoxy clay. Okay. Over the whole See, thing. See, I, I just – I don't use the epoxy clay at all, I guess, because – because I want to do so much of the creative process in the clay. So you I want, want maximum as options as far as how maximum deep you can flexibility. Go and, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. and flexibility. And so, okay. Yeah. I, well, I, I didn't even mean it that way, but yes, that way too. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it's it's a it's a tough thing. Yeah, like if if I'm a week into a piece and I realize that the buildup has gone in a way that I need to adjust the, the angle of a thing yeah. or that a pose would be, would be better if it was this other way. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to be able to just grab it and move it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and it's, it's the same with like packing it with tinfoil, you know, I uh, like, I don't know, like somehow mystically, if I put one little piece of tinfoil <laughs> in a spot, that's going to be way huger. And it's like, surely I won't expose this piece of tinfoil, you know, like Always. it's, it's just Always. going to happen. That is somehow, happen. <laughs> yeah, like somehow I'll be at a point in the process and I'll like dig in and I'll hit the foil and have to grab a pair of pliers and figure out yeah. a way to wrestle it out yeah. or something. It's, yeah. I, I don't understand it. Have you ever done, have you ever tried doing a, like a maquette that you don't care about, that you could have it flimsy and then do, Mm -hmm. you know, and work everything out in the maquette and just leave it rough and then build your armature based on the maquette, like really sturdy and super strong. So you have that strength. I have made little, little maquettes, um, but, um, but yeah, then when I made the final piece, I did not make it big and strong. <laughs> you still got to have that that uh, flexibility to be able to change things. I guess, and you know, and to an extent, like I, you know, I have the gauge of armature wire or like the gauges that I tend to like to use. Mm-hmm. And when I, when when the moment takes me and I decide that this is like I need to I need to grab the stuff and just do the thing right now, like. I don't want that to be the time when I have to get in the car and go to the art supply store and stuff, you know, like I want that to be the moment that I grab the stuff and just fucking do it. Um, and so maybe if I just had like a bigger selection of, of armature supplies on hand all the time, but, um, that, yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to go that way, (laughs) but you're comfortable with your working technique. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, for the most part, it, it works out. Yeah. And, um, yeah, like even if it's the kind of a thing where, you know, it it seems to hold itself up for a day before it cracks in this one spot, you know, mm-hmm. that then at the very end of the process, you know, I'll, I'll just um, – I'll make sure that that part is finished and that's the last part that I do. And then I'll hold it up 
while I like grab the saw and cut that part off because mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to cut them apart right. to be molded anyway. Right, right. That's you what know? I was gonna ask you. The next question is yeah, and then I mean beyond that, <clears throat> the next big hurdle is okay. Well, like if that was sagging in the clay, will that also start sagging right. in the resin? Good point. Yeah, yeah. So who knows? Do, do you um do you save like your final detailing till after everything's chopped apart? I no. No, you, you finish I, the I, whole thing and then cut it up. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I but, mean, but, but, but then you have to the, touch it up sometimes, though, right? Uh, not really, because oh. normally when I when I cut it up, um, I cast the pieces, and there's normally enough of a gap when I'm rebuilding it that um, that I'll just um, I'll do that cleanup work with the epoxy putty when I'm seaming it. Oh, okay. Or not, I mean, not seaming it, but like, you know, putting it back rebuilding that. Yeah, yeah. For the final I'll piece. Ha- I'll let it happen then. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, unless when I'm, when I'm cutting it apart, something really gets messed up with the saw. Right. Yeah. But no, I mean, normally, you know, it, it goes pretty smoothly. So what are you, um, What's your what's your resin that you you like to use? Do you have a specific? Um, well, I I normally use quick cast from okay. Cellpack, mm-hmm. um, just because I I don't have a pressure pot, and so everything that I do just has to naturally degas, mm-hmm. and um, and that particular resin, it like it it seems to be. Um, have that like the highest viscosity. It's like, oh, is it the is it like it's the... it's super it's super watery. And I mean, like when I make like the spindly little fingers and stuff, right. I can pour it in there, and it gets it gets into all the nooks and crannies. I gotta order some and, of that next time. Yeah, Quick, it, yes. it does it does a really good job. Um, of course, now you know I'm three thousand miles from the nearest way to get it. <laughs> yeah, right. So I like I yeah, and I'm I'm still kind of feeling my way through what the available supplies here are going to be at the I'm moment. Sure it seems like it seems on. like all there is is a Reynolds. Right. Or, I mean, not yeah, but Re- smooth yeah. on. Yeah, um, yeah, They've and got I, I, stuff, I yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, normally when I've used their stuff, you know, it was vacuum chamber, pressure pot, and all that kind of stuff. So to just use use their products in the open air now, we'll we'll see how that goes. Yeah. 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 But um yeah. yeah. Huh. Have you have you messed with the uh uh translucent resins? That's the thing. Not a ton, just because again, you know, when you don't have a pressure pot and a yeah. vacuum chamber, um like with with opaque resins, if there's if there's like, you know, some tiny air bubbles as it long as they're not on lot. the surface, yeah, you're okay. A lot easier. A lot yeah, easier. but if you if you're dealing with tinted clear stuff, you know, even if an air bubble is a quarter inch underneath the surface, you can see it. Well, not only that, you've got seams because when you seam oh, well, that yeah. stuff and it and it, it gets chalky, totally. and then joining things together is an issue mm-hmm. because you know. Oh yeah, yeah. So so it's a, definitely a pain in the ass, but um, for you know, it's great for the stuff I do, which are these simple, blocky, big head casts or something that don't yeah. need a lot of seaming. Um, yeah. I'd like to do more stuff with with bronze instead. Mm-hmm. That like that's like actual question. bronze or bronze? Would, no, like actual actual bronze. You know, yeah. like I I would really love it if I could start having some some pieces cast in metal. Um, that would be, be really cool because yeah. I've never I've never had anything um, made in metal yet. Oh really? I, well, yeah. I, except actually, I did I I sculpted a pendant that's that I got cast in sterling. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, I mean, I guess it's just not not bronze is what I mean. Yeah. Like not like the actual foundry process. Right. Yeah. I'm sure there's yeah. a place in Atlanta. I'm sure there must be. There's yeah. Be. I just I just have to find a place that'll do a good job because like the only the only reason I started doing my own molding and casting um, in in resin was because I kept on having such nightmarishly awful experiences every time I would try to hire someone yeah. else to do it for me. <laughs> I know. I, I you remember. know, like because yeah, I really thought like oh I'm. I'm going to be a sculptor. Someone else can be a mold maker and I'll just pay them to do that. Right, yeah. And um, I guess the best laid plans of mice and men. You just got to find that, the right I, one. I found, yeah. I found, well, right, I do have to say, I found the right yeah, one like, and, and he's fucking Lee, Lee Shamels. Just oh yeah. Perfect. Lee is awesome. Yeah, he's perfect. Yeah. 
but like yeah the like the one positive experience that i had was um was with uh simon garcia for the slither um sculpture Mm -hmm. um yeah that that went great and he was awesome basically everyone else i ever dealt with was like in at some point in the process it didn't go well right yeah yeah it's good to know how to do the stuff anyway and it's it's kind of it's kind of cool to be involved in every aspect of, of the piece as well. I mean, Absolutely, just on like a yeah. co- cosmic level in a way you're, you know, your energy is in everything that you're, you're doing it from start to finish. Your hands are on everything. Your hands are on the mold. You're mixing this stuff. It's just yeah. kind of a cool, uh, little bonus, I think. No, that, yeah, that does make sense. And like, I, you know, I've gotten used to it enough that I can, I can enjoy the, the process of it. Yeah, I kind of. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, it can be maddening though. Yeah, in it, some way. it can be maddening, you know? but it is when you do it right. It's kind of fun <laughs> when you take your time, and it, it's really satisfying to make a really nice, clean mold that fits together well, and it's not all. You know, whenever I do molds, it's they always look like shit because I'm just always rushing and doing it the quickest way possible. But those times when you have the time to to do it right, it's actually <laughs> very satisfying. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also like, it's, it's good, like warm up work, you know, like normally when I first start working for the day, you know, I'm still kind of shaking off sleep and mm-hmm. waking up and, you know, I, I don't want to be making big creative decisions at that point. Right. Like it's nice to just be able to do something that is a little bit mundane and mindless. Yeah. That's yeah. still, mm-hmm. still productive, but, um, but I don't have to think about it while I do it. And, you know, like making, right, you know, more of just a task. mold. Yeah. But making mold walls, you know, for, mm-hmm. for like a box mold or something that like, that is just, it doesn't get more mindless than that. And, yeah. you know, I can, I can just kind of let, let my body do the work and let my mind just kind of float around. Right. Yeah. 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 What do you, uh, what's your mold? making material what do you what do you what do you cast what do you make your molds out of normally i use uh, the uh rebound Rebound. um yeah the rebound what is it 25 something like that it's it's from smooth on but it's basically a brush up silicone just because um again can't i can't vacuum so you know i needed to be able to make molds that i could Mm. minimize the amount of air bubbles in so it's a lot of me doing layer after layer and hovering over each layer with like a can of computer duster. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just trying to blow out all the bubbles. How, uh, how many layers do you go? It depends, you know, uh, like sometimes if I, like if I know that it's going to be just like a one-off and the only reason that I would be making multiple castings is if something goes wrong with the first one, right. I'll do as little as I can get away with. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with, with other stuff, I'll, I'll really build it up nice and thick. Hmm. What, uh, yeah. that's interesting. Re- yeah. I, I always forget about the brush up malts for smaller things. I've, I, I've got it so stuck in my head from, makeup effects for my you yeah. know 20 years of doing that or however long I was in that you know either doing a matrix mold where you're doing the yeah and then pouring it or um doing a block mold or something but I br- brush ups were always like something you did for in a, in like a, a life cast or something or well just something maybe something really big Okay, you know yeah. something so it's like to do something small i never really think or you know smaller smallish yeah um, i never think of that but that's that's always an option it's just an op- option i never consider I'm, I'm always thinking like matrix or block molds or whatever but that's yeah. a good that's a good idea um so you how about painting what do you are you uh painting your pieces with what do you paint yeah i with? like i I normally use acrylics and oils, mm. um, and I guess maybe weirdly, I sometimes mix them. Um, what? I mean, not, not <laughs> like not not like together, like right. in a blob, you know. But like um, on the same piece, at certain points in the process, I'll be using acrylics, and at other points, I'll be using oils. Right. Um, yeah, it it seems to work out pretty well. Um, 
Well, you can, you and, know, you can use the, the, as far as paintings go, you can use oil on top of acrylic, but you're not supposed to use acrylic yeah. on top of oil. So yeah, you and, that's, keep them- and that's normally, that's normally the way that I go about it because I find for, um, for dry brushing oils tend to like lay down in a much more like powdery, lovely kind of way. Mm-hmm, right. Yeah. It seems like with, with acrylics and when I'm doing dry brushing, um, you know, if you look close enough, you can almost always see the individual hair marks. Oh, right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And but with with oil, they can disappear. Um, and then you know, for for some stuff, I'll do I'll do airbrushing. Oh. Um, like yeah, spattery but, I mean, stuff, less, or just kind of less often. I mean, you know, well, I guess whatever whatever the piece yeah. calls for. Yeah. I mean, like with with my personal stuff. I mean, a lot of the time, I really consider the you know, the, the sculptural aspect of it to be the thing. Right. Um, and the paint job that I'll do will be really basic. And mostly it's just there to accentuate the, the, you know, the, the sculpting. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sense. So, I mean, a lot of the time it'll just be like a, like a, a dark wet coat and right. then like a, like a light dry brush. It's almost like a patina, like a patina, yeah. you know, totally. That's um, cool. You know, other other times I'll I'll go in deeper and do more stuff. You know, like I've done some um, some commission stuff for for Chris Velasco, where he, you know he he wanted um, more airbrushy, you yeah. know, different kinds of things. Um, yeah, and then definitely with you know with the day job stuff during that period, I was doing a lot more airbrushing. Right. Do you ever yes. use have, have you ever used the uh, spray paint? As the mold release technique? Uh, no. You it's, can use spray paint. As yeah. I was doing that for, in, until I went, moved on to translucent resin, all my mm-hmm. opaque stuff, I was doing, yeah, it was uh, Dan at Silpak told me about that. You know Dan? Okay. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's so cool. Yeah. Uh, such a great guy. Uh, he Dan was telling Adams. me that some guy, that he hadn't tried it, but some guy was using primer as his mold release and it and okay. so I was like okay I'm going to try that so I started using this black primer you have to it's there are potential problems if you, if it pools up or whatever and gets too you have to get get it the right uh um consistency and stuff but okay so if you don't use any mold release you spray them with black or whatever yeah. you want primer and then you cast it um, and, and also it'll, it'll pull away. So yeah, if you're doing like multiple piece molds, it's going to be trouble because they can stick together, but, yeah. um, it will bond it'll You'll pull it out of the mold and it'll be like part of the plastic. Like you can't scratch the, 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 uh, primer off. Like it chemically wow. bonds to the, to the primer. It's amazing. Huh? Like the heat and everything, so that might be. So if wow. you're doing opaque castings, you might want to mess around with that because yeah, it's, it's funny. Like I, I mean, the the only time I use mold release is when I'm getting ready to like pour up the second half of silicone, and I just paint Vaseline on it. Really? That's and that's all I've ever done. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. And when I'm doing the castings, I don't use any kind of release at all. I just do it dry. And like wow. at the beginning, <laughs> like people were people were telling me to use baby powder. Yeah. And yeah. I was doing that, and like. It wasn't making any difference. It was just making my apartment smells like gross. <laughs> so I just stopped. And so, yeah, I don't know. You can't I, get. I just a certain, I don't use anything. There's a certain amount of castings. Yeah. That you- well, I mean, but the but the, the the runs that I'm doing of stuff, like, I, I never need to cast like 70 of something. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just, yeah. I'm yeah, bad. like it. I mean, most most of the things that I make, unless it's you know like a like a smaller thing, like once or twice I've made things that had like larger runs, but maybe at, at tops there'll be ten. Wow. Okay. You know, and it's weird because that, that's that's another thing that may, maybe I'll kick myself for in the future, but um, I don't keep track of my my additions. You know, um, like yeah, like certain certain pieces. 
I, I don't remember how many I made or how many <laughs> might be out there, you know, wow. and like, and, and so there's kind of nothing to reflect in a price right? You, you, because it's always weird to try to figure out like, okay, well, how am I going to price this? It's an, if it's a one of a kind, I can't price it the same way as if right. there's 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but then I, I don't know how many of my things are out there, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but like, but I, I know that it always ends up being less than I allow myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. if I say, Oh, you know, I'll cap this one off at 10, then, you know, I'll lose count. But like thinking back on it, like maybe there's six. Yeah. You're not doing 12, but, but I like, but I'm never, yeah, I'm never yeah, doing more. That's the, that's the real, uh, danger. As long as you're not yeah. doing more than the addition. Yeah. Well, and also when I, when I moved just, um, because, um, just, uh, just what that process is like, it's, it's a lot. I ended up just striking a lot of molds and, um, that were sitting in my closet. So a lot of, a lot of things that potentially were going to, you know, have more castings made. Mm. Well, at this point, what, what there is is what there is because that mold is gone. Right. Right. Yeah. Wow. And you know, it's, it's for the best, you know, you don't want to yeah. hold on, hold on to everything forever. Oh, for sure. And especially yeah. when it comes to limited editions, you don't want to just have them go on and on and on. You want them to be special and limited, Yeah. you know, and it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it benefits the collector too. If totally. you're not doing more casts and, and continuing, I didn't, you know what? I didn't even ask you. I, I know it's getting late and you need to go to sleep because that's yeah, fine. But um, I didn't ask you uh, why did you? Did we talk about why you moved? Oh well, I, I mean, I guess I st- I started to talk yeah. about it because <laughs> because like you know of how I like the reason I initially moved to L.A. was oh, to right. do something that I ended up never doing. Right, right. Um, and what I did end up doing was having a day job that I didn't care for, you know? (laughs) And so, you know, when, when the pandemic happened and that, and that kind of evaporated, it put me in a situation where, you know, where it's like, okay, well, if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm not doing that thing anymore, and I'm not doing the thing that I came here to do in the first place. Why am I here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, and granted, like I, like, you know, I had a huge amount of like, of, of like really wonderful friends, right. you know, like I, I, I was really lucky to meet a lot of really cool people, you mm-hmm. know, and hopefully they'll keep on being in my life forever, no matter where I am. Right. But, um, but, you know, trying to, trying to make a living doing the kind of thing that we do you know, it seemed like it would be a lot more achievable in a place with a lower cost of living. Totally. Man. Um, yeah. So I kind of traded in my wildfires and earthquakes for tornadoes and hurricanes. <laughs> Why did you choose Atlanta? Well, I, I guess mostly because I have family here. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. So I, I figured, um, mm. you know, once once I realized that you know, that I was going to move. Um, I mean, what I do, I can do anywhere. So how do you choose, how do you choose where to go? And, um, you know, the fact that we are in like this weird pandemic situation where I'm kind of not allowed to make new friends, Mm -hmm, you know, like I'm kind of not allowed to meet people. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had kind of like a automatic social structure here, you know, having, having some family and their friends who I've, you know, gotten to know over the years yeah. when I came to visit and stuff That's like that. That's going to make things easier. So yeah, it, it seemed like it's, you know, just kind of like instant community just at Matt. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, that was, that was the thinking. So is it, how much cheaper is it compared to where you were living before? You know, it's, is it a lot? It's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> It's a lot easier. I mean, I'm not saying specifics. Yeah, because I, like, I, I mean, just even like, just as far, as far as like you know, like my living situation, I, I'm, I have a lot more for a lot less. Really? Yeah. So you got like uh, space to work and everything, and totally, yeah, yeah. That must and be so. Exciting. You know, and and as as time goes on, it seems like you know that has the potential to get even better. 
um, you know, just right. because for now I'm, I'm just renting and it seems like the, you know, rental prices are cheaper than LA, but, um, but the cost of actually owning a home is ridiculously lower. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, it seems like out, out here you can get like a four bedroom, three bath house for like 250 grand. Wow. And I mean, in Burbank, that would have been what, like a million four. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's so insane. I mean, you know, it's yeah. No, yeah, no, and it's you no know, question. yeah, and that was that was another another part of the whole thing, you know. Like I, I always thought it would be cool to get into like you know the the movie effects, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the the people that I know that that are that are succeeding in that. You know, the people that, that have attained that brass ring that, mm -hmm. you know, that I thought, you know, would be fun to go after, <clears throat> you know, like they're, they're living in one bedroom apartments. Right. Yeah. And, and they're, <laughs> and they're renting them, you know, and yeah. it's not because they don't want a house. Yeah. yeah. So it's one, you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, yeah, like I would have to really, really make sure that I love that thing to put my effort into just getting my foot in the door, you right. know, because like, I, you know, I hear stories of, you know, like the, um, I was listening to the, uh, when you were talking to, to Casey Love, mm -hmm. you know, and he, and he was saying he had that experience, um, <clears throat> where Steve Wang just said, well, you know me right. and that, and that kind of, you know, opened the, the door for him, right. you know, in, in, 12 years of meeting people and doing like monster palooza shows and going to art openings and all these things, you know, that was not my experience. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, you know, like I, I would bring up that I, I thought it would be neat to someday try to work on a movie and it would like, you know, you couldn't get people away from me faster. You, you, you're, if you're you just... want to clear a room, you, you ask if anybody's <laughs> hiring. <laughs> well, you, you know, you dodged a bullet there. You dodged yeah, a bullet yeah. there, I mean, believe from, me. Yeah. I'm sure you've yeah, heard. From, from I know I've said, told said you. I've, yeah. I've told you plenty of stories. Um, so I, I think you, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, I believe. I mean, clearly. And it feels it feels right. I mean, and, you know, and I also want to do a lot more teaching because oh, um, cool. I, I, I miss it. And I like I really <clears throat> have had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. Like at, at various points. You know, I've had um, like just workshops around L.A. Mm -hmm. and um, for for a hot minute, I taught at the cinema makeup school. Mm. Um, I did that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, you know, like that that kind of stuff is awesome. And I, yeah. you know, I've been doing a little bit of like video tutoring just over Zoom and stuff like that since all the pandemic oh, stuff yeah. happened. It I seems mean... it seems like you know that the pandemic stuff. I mean, it, as much for me as for anyone else, like whatever residual wall that I had up about video stuff, it's, um, it's, down. Like it's, it's gone, you <laughs> yeah. know, like it's, it feels, it feels pretty natural at this mm -hmm. point to, you know, to be, to be talking the way that we are now. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, cause you know, though I, nobody might realize it, but I can see you right now. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's true. I don't, I don't, we, when I do these interviews, there's video so we can see each other, but I, yeah. I know what you're saying. And I don't, I kind of think that it's not going to go back. I mean, it's going to yeah. go back to some degree, but I think that video conferencing and teaching, it makes, yeah. it just makes more sense. People are spread out everywhere. Yeah. Everything. And it getting... seems like another, another reason that it's okay to not be in LA. I right. mean, you know, yeah. cause like Absolutely. a really, Really soon, I, I hope to, you know, like make some announcements about some, you know, just online classes being available. Um, Excellent. Uh, yeah, hopefully people will be into that because I, you know, I don't know, I miss hanging out and sculpting. And that's, that's honestly, that's kind of what it feels like. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's everybody, everybody's learning, but like the, the vibe just always feels to me like I'm just hanging out with a bunch of new friends making and art right. and talking about art. And yeah, it just, yeah. it's what's, what's better than that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Steve, Steve Clef, uh, started this dark art society art jam thing. They've been doing every Friday where people oh, just nice. get on zoom and hang out and, and make stuff. And it's, it's pretty amazing. It's really great. You know, getting together Very with cool. people and, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, when you, if you got a, 
Well, no, you can do it. You're doing it here. You can yeah. jump on there if you feel like <laughs> it. Um, but this is a, a great conversation, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. This is super fun. I mean, Thanks for I, having I, me. I, yeah, I this feel is like I go for another two hours, but I, I don't. I don't want totally. I don't want to keep you up. I know it's late, and I'm like, eh. like I said, I'm completely burned myself yep. from this last week. Um, so I had to work all all Halloween. It was so hard. I just wanted to wow. be celebrating Halloween, and I was just grinding it out. But it's uh, all right. It's always Halloween to me, anyway. So. Yep, there you go. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for coming on and taking the time to talk. I know it's it's been something I've been wanting to have you on for a long time, so I'm glad we finally made it happen. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, thanks for just, yeah, <laughs> wanting to talk to me in the first place. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah you've been on the list forever. So, um, yeah, well, thanks for, for coming on. And, uh, oh, what do you, do you have uh, anything currently you want to promote or anything you're working on or gosh well, what is that sculpt you got to tell me real quick what that sculpture is you're working on because you mentioned you're working on a new piece right yeah it's it's um man it's a crazy thing i've been making like a, a lot of posts about it on on the patreon just because it's my current piece um oh yeah and okay. I've, I've i've teased a couple progress photos on instagram I've, I've seen your but, notifications um, but i have i haven't yeah. even had time to look at anybody's patreons because i'm following a bunch but yeah. I, I did get the notifications yeah but it's um yeah it's it's a it's a thing i'm i'm excited about i don't know i don't want to give away the, okay. the surprises but yeah there's a like there's a lot of a lot of clouds and a lot of rock oh and so yeah like like a lot of a lot of non-figure things involved oh, cool. and so that's yeah it's fun okay so you're as far as the patreon goes because we should promote i mean i'll put all that stuff yeah. in, in the links yeah there's there's but... a link to that uh i guess in the bio of my Instagram, and also there's links to all of it on um, on my website, What's your um, website? which is ma- matthewjlevin.com. Okay. Um, but the the Patreon is just patreoncom slash Levin. Cool, and we'll yeah. put it in the description as well. And you're going to be doing more. It's going to be more active. You're going to be for so people that want to learn from you can learn from me on Patreon as well, right? I mean, you're- absolutely, yeah. Like the the different um, the different levels that I have set up. Um, yeah, there's, there's live streaming, there's like conversational stuff. Um, there's like one-on-one tutoring Killer. and like all, like all sorts of things. Excellent. Yeah. Like, I mean, that goes back to the teaching, you yeah, know, like yeah. one of, one of the price points, you know, just gives you just, you know, a free hour each month of, of, you know, online video tutoring. Excellent. Yeah. I do that too. Um, so, That's great. Cool. Yeah. So, well, people who want yeah, to sculpt. There should be a lot more of it. If you want to sculpt cre- figures and creatures, go join Matt's Patreon because uh, he's the man. He's the man who's doing it. He's doing awesome <laughs> stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. So, I'll, like I said, I'll ha- all that will be in the description as well. All of your links and stuff. So, um, your in- and your Instagram is. Oh, it, that's uh, Matt L twenty one. Matt L twenty one. Okay. And yeah, and there's there's a story behind that too. <laughs> and we'll, I, I guess it starts that. Basically, uh, by the time I got on Instagram, every possible permutation of my name was already taken. Uh-huh. Um, and when I when I was in the third grade um, in elementary school, um, the teacher gave us each a number so that we could line up to like walk to assemblies and different things like that. Uh-huh. And um, and there were two mats in the class. And so I was Matt L and my number was 21. And so at the top of every paper I wrote for that whole year, like I, I always wrote Matt L 21. Um, <laughs> and uh, it like, it became like a, like a weird family joke. And, <laughs> That's great. and then some, yeah, somehow when, when Instagram came along and, you know, yeah. And you remember. I, I swear there was no other version of my name that was left available. <laughs> yeah. Even like when I first got on Twitter, though, I'm not on it anymore. Uh, like the closest I could get was Matt Lev because Matt Levin was taken and it, like everything else was taken. But Matt Lev wow. at least was, was enough of my name that it was still there. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Well, that's yeah. That's a story that my my mom will enjoy if yeah. she listens to this. Maybe maybe no one else did, and I apologize. <laughs> I enjoyed it. 
I enjoyed okay. it. That's what it's all about, man. Personal stories. All right. I'm gonna let cool. you I'm gonna let you get some sleep. Okay, so uh right. thank you everybody for listening. And let's say goodbye, Matt. Say goodbye to the audience. Goodbye. See you later, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.